Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today we're going to talk about a great museum. I want to talk about the San Francisco's uh, Asian Art Museum. It's not a terribly old museum. It was built in the 1960s. But how it was built and why it was built is a very, very interesting story. And it's all thanks to one man. And without him, this wouldn't have ever happened. The museum would have simply never been built. And his name was Avery Brundage. And uh, those of you that know who he, he was, you may know him uh, as being a, a powerful driver behind the, uh, the museum. There's been books written about his collection. You may know about him from the business world because he was a legendary uh, builder. He, he was he owned a construction company in Chicago. And he became very, very wealthy um, in the 1920s and 30s. And you may know him as the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee and eventually the World Olympic Committee. But we're going to go through that and show how all of that came together to form one of the greatest collectors who's ever lived. And um, th this was his story. All right. Avery Brundage was born um, basically into poverty or raised in poverty. He was born in 1887 in Detroit, and his life is m much more of a Horatio Alger story than anybody else I can really think of right now. He was born in Detroit, and at the age of five, his father and mother and his brother Chester were all moved to, to uh, Chicago. His father was looking for work. He was a stonemason. And shortly after arriving in Chicago, um, his father abandoned them. He abandoned the whole family and left them. And um, from then on, he was raised by his mother and with the help of relatives. Fortunately, they had a few relatives in the area, but they were poor as well. Um, and so young Avery had to uh, get himself a job when he was very, very young, anything to help make money for the family. He ran errands, he had a paper route, did all kinds of things. Fortunately, Avery was also a very gifted student, an incredibly gifted student. He was very bright in mathematics, science, and he had a real penchant for uh, engineering and science and wanting to know how things were put together. He was a highly curious man. He really was. And while attending um, uh, high school and college, he became, on top of it, a very highly ranked um, uh, field and track star, an athlete. Um, and he competed. He, he developed um, a, a, a nationwide ranking. He was highly, he was highly regarded. And in 1912, he, he competed in the Summer Olympics. And uh, he continued to compete after the Summer Olympics uh, for another six or eight years until he decided he could no longer do it. But he loved sports, he loved athletics, and he was very interested in the administration of sports, how they manage teams, how teams could be brought together to compete. He was, he was very interested in drawing people from all over the world to compete in sports, um, sort of like in the, in the manner of the ancient Greeks. He just loved it. And um, he remained in sports for the rest of his life. All right, but um, uh, and, and due to his uh, and, and while all this was going on, he was also building a construction company in Chicago. He he ended up building some of the largest buildings in Chicago. He built a huge Model T assembly plant. He built the Morrison Hotel. Uh, he built all kinds of things, and it made him pretty wealthy. A lot of the money disappeared at the beginning of the Depression, and he managed to make it all back. But because of his devotion to sports. <clears throat> in 1928, uh, uh, he was asked if he'd be interested in being on the International Olympic Committee. This was the Global Committee, and he accepted immediately, and he stayed in that committee from 1928, it's amazing, till 1972. He died in 75. He died shortly later, shortly after that. And during this time, um, General Douglas MacArthur, who we all know, he, he had been the president of the American Olympic Committee, and he wanted to step down. He had, his military uh, uh, obligations were, were, were taking up a lot of his time, and they asked Avery Brundage if he would like to become the president of the uh, American Olympic Committee, known then as the AOC. He accepted it. He took the job for 20 years. Later, he would go on to become the president of the International Olympic Committee. This was for the whole world, and he held that job from 1952 to 1972, in addition to being on the board. He was kind of controversial. He, he had ideas about sports and athletics that a lot of people didn't like. He, he despised professional athletics. He thought all sports should be amateur um, and that kind of thing. So uh, he, he was always controversial. He was always in the news. All right. But fortunately for him, he, he was um, he had lots of money and he happened to be in the at the at the Summer Olympics in 1936 in Germany. And on his way back, he stopped in London. And if you know if you're familiar with old exhibitions and shows and whatnot that were going on in London back then, this was the, the greatest exhibition that had ever been mounted uh, pretty much even to this day in the world. It was the Royal Academy exhibition at Burlington House. 
and that exhibition ran for a couple years, 1935 to 1936, and it was an epic, epic thing. Uh, about a thousand pieces were uh, put on loan from the newly created Palace Museum, which was built in 1925 during the Republican period, and uh, they they got together with uh, the the Brits. Uh, d uh, with Percival David sort of uh, uh, leading the charge, and they managed to round up not only the uh, the, the, the palace collection to bring over uh, roughly a thousand pieces, but they were able to draw in um, a lot of pieces, three thousand more pieces from private collectors around the world. Because at that time, collecting was really in its fullest full, and there were famous dealers around like C. T. Lou and J. T. Ty, and all of these people selling to very very powerful wealthy people in the West collectors. And Japan and it was a confluence and all this stuff was brought in and this is a great photograph this is a photograph of the HMS Suffolk offloading in Portsmouth with um, a, 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 a bunch of crates of uh, Chinese and Asian art and they were going to be transferred over to the HMS hood the, could that, the hood that could then bring them down to London um, which was which was um, where the show was going to be done and then um, here are the, some of the trucks, removals, Bishop and Sons, Repositories Limited. And uh, here's one of the, there are three of their trucks lined up getting ready to unload at Burlington House. And here is one of the big pieces that was in the uh, exhibition. This is absolutely astonishing. Uh, you notice the people standing next to it. This is a big limestone Buddha, uh, absolute beast. It was brought over. Obviously, these are in sections. You can see the seams. And they were getting it back together. The amazing part of this exhibition is a little side note was that all of this was done. The Chinese government sent all this stuff over and they didn't insure any of it. They just shipped it and said, yeah, that's great, we'll do, do an exhibition. Uh, private collectors and so forth, of course, who, who, who loaned things, did insure everything and, and so forth. Uh, amazingly, none of the stuff was destroyed. And uh, this, these were the rooms that Avery Brundage, the, the Olympic Committee guy, the, the, the construction guy from Chicago, the very bright, inquisitive uh, man, a fan of history. Uh, this is what he saw. And he was so amazed by what he saw at, 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 at this Royal Academy exhibit, and who wouldn't be? He went back for, for a week. He, he delayed his return to the U.S., and he apparently just stayed here and kept going back to, the, to this show every, every uh, day and uh, studying each section. His particular favorite became, uh, in, in, during this time, was he became fascinated with ancient Chinese Shang bronzes in particular, all right? And this was uh, uh, the Ming porcelain room that they had, had set up uh, for, the, for the Royal Academy. And you can click over, um, and then we're going to post these on a blog on our site so that you can come and see these pictures. They're quite evocative. This is a room that looks like it has lacquer in it. Here's a room with, uh, with some of the early, early bronzes. Unfortunately, it's a little dark, but um, uh, just you can get a sense of it. And uh, here you have, again, more cases with more bronzes. And it went on and on and on. And this is what this guy saw. And these are some of the, the Chinese representatives that were here. The man in the middle is um, uh, uh, Percival David. And without him, this show wouldn't have happened. He was, he was the guy. All right. If you don't know who he is, uh, he founded the David Foundation. Um, his collection is now at the British Museum. He was the owner of the famous, um, known as the David vases, the big yawn dynasty elephant handle vases that are dated and inscribed and probably the most important documentary ceramics in the world. Um, he bought them and they were in his collection and it was all went to the David Foundation and then eventually the David Foundation merged into the British Museum. And here he is again with um, um, uh, Tang Jing Fen, one of the curators. Here's one of the other big exhibition rooms. And you can just imagine um, Avery Brundage walking through here going, wow. And he was absolutely smitten with this. This is a fantastic uh, early Qing uh, carpet. Uh, just absolutely unbelievable, um, uh, unbelievably rare. And you can see here there's a cloisonne elephant with a double gourd vase on his back. And there's some more metalworks over in here. And then over here, you have all these little uh, porcelain monochromes that were put on display, probably Kung Shi period, judging by the shapes. And uh, then you have this wonderful, another big limestone Buddha, just beautifully done. And um, this was what he saw. And by the time this exhibition was over and he was done with it, he, the bug had bitten him. And he wanted to start collecting. And he did. And... Um, he, he went to work uh, right away, and he, early on he started collecting bronzes. 
And um, um, one of the one of the bronzes he bought is the most famous in his collection, and it's sort of the uh, uh, it's the emblem for the uh, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Now it's it's probably their most famous famous piece. It's uh, let's take a look over here. Here it is. We just uploaded this onto the uh, reference bookcase at bitamount.com. If you want to come over and go through it, it's quite a book. But um, in here, are, are, uh, it's a small monograph on some of the bronzes he owned. And this is the bronze of the rhinoceros. All right, It is one of the rarest Shang bronzes in, uh, ever known. It has an inscription in the bottom, um, on the interior, in the, in, 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 in the center. Um, uh, it was commissioned by the last Shang emperor. It's missing its cover. But beyond that, this is uh, as simple as it looks. This elegant little el uh, rhinoceros, it's a Sumatran uh, rhino, by the way. It's got two horns on its head. Um, just unbelievably rare. Just uh, the rarest of the rare of the rare in the entire world. Okay, that's, that's how important it is. And uh, he, he began collecting um, with great abandon. And um, he assembled a massive collection. And it, it, he's getting on toward the end of his life. He wanted to be in a museum. He thought museums loved his things. He was famous for his collection. And the, he said, I'll donate my entire collection of 7,800 roughly objects if the city of San Francisco or somebody will build a museum to house it. And after a, a little bit of negotiations, the, the city of San Francisco donated, at the time they had a lot of land, they donated the land to build a museum on. They gave him the land, they built the museum, and he was good to his word, he gave them his collection. And when the museum, uh, a few years ago, I think I read somewhere that 65% of this collection's, this museum's collection is all from Avery Brundage to this day. Uh, and and be, one of the things is, how are you going to go out and buy better things than he was able to get back then? That's the, sort of the, the most amazing part of, a, of it. And a lot of it are, is bronzes, and a lot of it is porcelain. And um, we're going to get into it and go through some of the pieces. And we'll, we have added a link to the museum on the home page at Bitamount that you can come over if you want to see the museum yourself, you want to go through the pictures, come over here to the, uh, the, the uh, yellow drop down menus. And uh, here it is, Asian Art Museum San Francisco. And we have a link uh, uh, to uh, the museum itself. And we have added, since we did this, a second link just to the Brundage part of the collection, which, they, which you can do. You can do it either way, but you get to it all anyway. But th that's where we're going to do, and we're going to start with it in just a second. So hold on. So let's get started. This is this is the uh, landing page that you'll come into if you click the link off our home page in the yellow boxes we mentioned earlier. And uh, these are just some of the things. We've got it selected over to look at some of the bronzes, and here they are. There's a lot of them. There are a lot of bronzes in this collection uh, and some great bronzes. So if you're a bronze person, um, you really want to come and check this out. But they also have a huge collection. Uh, Brundage got very much into collecting Chinese ceramics. Um, uh, on uh, almost with equal abandon with, with all periods from uh, Tang, Sung, Yan, Ming, and Qing in imperial pieces too. He, he really had no limits on what his areas of interest were. He just, he was fascinated and that's how it went. So we're going to walk through some of them and give you an idea of what's in this museum. There's also, I should point out, there are a lot of objects in the museum too are the types of things in, in their general collection that you would find uh, at an auction uh, in the United States or you might find at an auction, you would more likely find it at an auction in Northern Europe. A lot of Ming material, a lot of blue and white material, and that kind of thing. And of course, here we have, this is the famous rhinoceros that we talked about a few seconds ago. Uh, Shang Dynasty, it's a beautiful ritual object. And the museum has used this sort of as their icon for uh, quite a few years because of its extreme rarity and uh, so forth. But it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful example. And if you like patinas and surfaces, you want to check it out. One of the things that Avery Brundage did was he, he was a very... Uh, a big uh, fan of great patinas. He liked nice surfaces on things. He didn't like things that had been disturbed. So you get things like this, this really great wine vessel known as a poo, uh, beautifully done, deep, deep green, uh, you know, almost looks like it was painted on. It's not. That's a natural patina. Uh, this is a better shot of it right there. Uh, beautifully done. And it was, you know, these aren't terribly big. Uh, these tend to be fairly small. This one's around 10 inches tall. 
and uh, just a, a great example. And then you get onto this, uh, another type of Western Zhao bronze. It's a ritual or a food vessel. And again, unbelievably great patina. The patina almost it, it looks like a mineral or it looks very minerally, very polished the way it is. And this is, this is uh, the kind of thing that he was just absolutely wild for, or especially in the, in the first uh, five or 10 years of his collecting. And then you have this, the wine vessel. Uh, he, uh, a beautiful example, great surface again, in beautiful condition, top-notch casting, uh, top quality casting all the way around it. Here it is, they provide a number of different images. Uh, their images don't enlarge, so this is about as big as they get, but they're big enough and you can enlarge them on your own screen um, if you wish. All right, and then he also had things like this. This was one of his pieces, a very rare uh, goo form yellow. Egg yolk yellow, imperial, sort of an imperial yellow, Kung Shi period vase. This was not a big one. It was about seven inches tall, but uh, extremely pretty and beautifully done and in beautiful condition, obviously. All right, and that is a bronze form, as, you, as many of you know. That, uh, this thing is based on a bronze form, so it's not a big surprise as to why he might have bought it. And then he also liked very strongly decorated Kung Shi pieces. He liked uh, 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 the, the colors. He liked the shape. And, uh, and it's just the same reason so many people like Kung Shi wears. And this was a beautiful example of, uh, of women sitting around a table playing a game, musical instruments. And again, as we talked about before, that sort of idyllic Chinese scene of uh, uh, cultural life, uh, just very nice vase. And this was about 18 inches tall. And then over here to this, the thing that I found funny was going through his, his, the, his collection, the things that were signed to him. He liked to buy pairs of porcelain of rare, rare types. This is a very, very rare Kangxi, uh, Kangxi period uh, water pot, as you all know, in, in underglazed red. And, he, and with underglazed red and blue, there's some underglazed blue there around the mouth. Um, there's a better shot of it. Now you can see the blue very clearly. But an incredibly fine example. Just uh, the, the, the underglazed red on this was absolutely superb. The color, the evenness, there's no, there's no flashes where it got too hot in the kiln, turned green, uh, you know, didn't have any iron, uh, copper oxide reactions during the firing. And he had a pair of these. He had a pair of several others of these of the same type as well. All right, and then on to this. This is this is a really dandy little Kangxi box. It's a, it's a they, they call it here a painter's box, which it is. Here it is opened up, and you can see the interior where the where the, where the ink, uh, the paints and brushes went, and all this business done in in, in this very very beautiful deep green uh, ukai uh, uh, enamels, uh, and they they provide a picture of it together and open which is nice. I wish they showed a picture of the bottom of it, though. I, I like to see the bases of things. And then this, the, there are a set of uh, some of the best Kangxi month cups I've ever seen. Um, there's, they have all of them illustrated. I'm only going to show you one. But the quality of the decoration on this month cup is just exceptional. Uh, the enamels are good, bright, and crisp, and clear. The blue is that very, very soft uh, sort of uh, background blue that, they, that you would see on these, a very soft sort of violet blue. And uh, this, this is uh, one of a set of 12. These are about two inches tall. They're not very big, but they're unbelievable quality. And then apparently he sh sort of shifted gears a bit here, and he got into, into things like this, a young Lo Ewer in blue and white, Ming Dynasty. And I can kind of understand it. it, it was a, this was a form that was produced in the uh, court uh, during the Yonglo period for export uh, trade to the Middle East as gifts. These were highly prized at the time. And this particular one is based on an Islamic metal form. And uh, Brundage's interest in metals may have played into that, but they're fairly good size. This is about 14 inches tall. It is an extreme rarity. Uh, but he, back when he was buying, uh, did most of his buying in the 40s and the 1950s, uh, China was in flux. There was a lot of material floating around, uh, and, and people weren't spending that much money on it. The interesting story behind that, the, the original, the bronze with the rhino that he bought, he, he made some comment that it cost him the price of five Cadillacs at the time. And a Cadillac at round then was probably around $4,000. And, the, and he, they, they believe that he bought it from J.T. Tai uh, around 1952. That's sort of what they researched it to. There were no receipts for it. 
All right, and then on to this. This is Li Bai, the 8th century poet on a, on a Zixiao uh, jar. Uh, and the reason I, I wanted to show that this type of Zixiao ware is not that rare, but the potting and shape of this is just phenomenal. And uh, here are some pictures of it going around the piece. And there's the poet himself. Here he is sleeping, uh, dreaming, as they, as they like to used to write about. And uh, this is a pretty nice size pot. It was 13 inches tall. And uh, uh, it's, it was either made in the Yan or, the, or, or into the early Ming Dynasty, but beautifully done. And then on this, this Mei Ping, Song Dynasty, uh, this is a big boy. This thing is 16 inches tall, which is quite big for, for um, uh, Song pieces, northern Song. Um, beautifully done. These have a very fine crackle on them. Um, you can't really see it, but if you look carefully, if you come to the site and, and blow it up, you'll be able to see the crackle and the glaze all through here. All right, these are these are very rare. They tend to be flat bottomed, um, uh, with no glaze at all. There's no foot rim on them. It's just a flat base, and uh, a, a very nice example. And then on to this, the Yuan Dynasty, Song to Yuan Dynasty. They they never they sort of they sort of hedge on these at times, but Celadon Kong vase, just a beautiful example. And what's great about this is this one is is that the color, the evenness of the glaze is just superb. It's absolutely perfect. And you notice at the bottom here, the glaze ends very, very neatly just above the foot, uh, allowing it not to get stuck to the floor of the, of, of the, of the, of the, of the sagar when it was being fired or in the kiln. All right, and then on to this, a fantastic big northern sung. This thing is almost 20 inches tall. Um, uh, Zizhao uh, scrolling peony vase. And most of these are not this refined. This one is highly refined. Uh, the, the glaze is absolutely perfect, the decoration is absolutely per perfect, and the proportions are absolutely perfect. It's just a great example. And uh, as, as I said, he, he, he branched out into many, many things. And then he jumped from those over to these, Yongchen period, a uh, uh, very nice brush stand. These come apart. This thing is in sections. It's a sectional affair. but. Um, highly valuable, unbelievably rare. It's got that sort of, when they started experimenting with glazes, that sort of early faux bois uh, wooden uh, uh, glaze that they were able to do. And then all this very, very, very fine enameling. And then all this reticulated work, all these cutouts in here. It's very, very delicate work, very difficult to do. And then you get to you get to fire it so that when, it, when you fire porcelain, it shrinks. And the, whoever the potter was had to be able to f fire these, to create them and fire them so that they would still fit together once the firing was done because there is shrinkage. And uh, it, that alone is quite a feat when you're, when you're building a three-piece or you know, three-section piece of porcelain. This measures around seven inches tall. And uh, as you see, it's in Fenkai glaze, just beautifully, beautifully done. And then over here to this, the teapot. This I've never even seen this type of tea. This 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 form with that decoration on it, with these berries. It's Yong Chen period, uh, but just fantastically well drawn. And the porcelain is so crisp and white, with this beautiful vine going up the spout, and then the stepped top, and this nicely proportional rounded handle to conform with the uh, with the spout on the piece. And that's the kind of thing, you, you, if you get to this museum or you come and look on their site, the kinds of things you're going to see. And then on to this. This is quite something, something from the Jundi Emperor. Uh, these big uh, grapes pattern export uh, dishes. Uh, these tended to be pretty good size, 14 to 16 inches or so. Um, and this is an absolutely superb quality example. This form was imported a great deal um, uh, to the Middle East. It was shipped. This was a very popular pattern in the Middle East. And in Turkey, they, they got these. And uh, the design on these were used in the first Iznik pieces that were produced in Turkey. They're emulating these. And they looked extremely similar, except the Iznik examples are fired in pottery. That's the only difference. And they do provide a picture of the back of it here. That's what the bottom of one of these looks like to help you out if you if you if you're looking at one just as an aside these things like that young low you are this type of plate you are not going to encounter at a local auction I can pretty safely say anywhere in America or, you know you know you, one might turn up somewhere in Europe in an old collection maybe in Italy somewhere in an old collection but uh, the, the all of the real ones of these is only a handful um, are uh, you, you don't have to worry about seeing one anytime soon. They do provide this a nice big blow-up pattern on it. These are beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. 
And then uh, we'll pop over to this. Uh, no, we've, we've seen that. We've seen that. Oh, we haven't seen this bronze yet, the, the Fang Yi. Uh, nice looking Fang Yi box. <clears throat> there was one of these sold uh, a couple of years ago, as you may recall, the, uh, the uh, collection in Japan um, that Christie's did. Um, here's a picture of the inside of it. Uh, it was that uh, the, the, the Saki King in Japan. I can't remember his name. But at any rate, he had one of these, and here's another one. Uh, and uh, just, again, a great example, and about 11 inches tall. And then on to this. this. I put this in because it was interesting. At first, I thought it might have been a piece of rouware. They don't. I don't think they have one. Uh, maybe they do. I, I couldn't find it, though. But this is a, t a very nice chin long example um, of, of, of a type of rouware. And if you flip it over, <clears throat> here's the rain mark on the back, chin long mark and period. And it just shows that uh, uh, the Chinlung Emperor was a big fan of, 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 of very rare porcelains, and rouware were done for the imperial courts, as we all know. And they began producing um, sort of rouware remakes. And uh, Mr. Uh, Brundage was smart enough to grab himself one, uh, which I think is pretty great. And then here you have this Henan Province Tang Dynasty horse, tomb horse. I love this horse. I love the surface on the body. It almost looks like rust. Uh, and these are, of course, pottery body, bodies. But this is a beautiful, beautiful example. The, the animal is so muscular. The way the head is done, the neck, the, 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 through here, the, the, the jaw, the mouth slightly open, and uh, the rider up straight, up, upright and rigid on the saddle. Uh, just a, a beautiful example. And uh, this was a pretty big one. It was 26 inches tall. Some are bigger, but that's a good size horse. That's a good example. And then over here, another great piece of tangware. This is one of these uh, flower-shaped uh, uh, Tatsu's footed, footed stands. Uh, not, not terribly terribly big, about 10 inches wide. But here's a good image shot of it, a uh, good detail shot of it. And you can notice that the back of it has that very nice uh, tang amber glaze that you see. You see the same glaze on a, lo a lot of Liao wares as well, that soft amber. And here you see the base, the legs that come down were left unglazed. They did not glaze the legs on these. They just, they just shaped the pottery and uh, did them that way. But uh, the color combinations on this are so appealing. And you can see how they incised the piece before they put, applied the, sort of dropped the glaze in there very gently and how they did the back up to this edge. I, I don't know how they did the glazing on this. That's a real trick so it doesn't spill over. And uh, again, uh, Brundage bought that for, for his collection and then on to this. This I like a lot. It's a Tang Dynasty and it's black glaze and it's not all that rare really. But the shape of this is just absolutely fabulous. This very nicely rounded body. And then they sort of pinched in the two handles up here. It's, it, it's, it's sort of like they're almost fighting for a position on the piece because the, the shape of the pot is so powerful. But notice how nice and white the, uh, the, the paste is on the pot underneath. All right, this is what you know tang paste should look like on these pots. And you'll notice that the glaze sort of drapes as it comes down over the body. Uh, just a beautiful example, but the pot is so powerfully potted. It makes the shape uh, with that black glaze just stand out. And the glaze appears to be in wonderful shape, wonderful condition. And then on to this. This I, 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 I put in because it's not an especially refined piece, but it's a beautiful, beautiful, deep, dark, almost purple cobalt glaze on it. Um, uh, again, you can see the, the glaze stops nicely above the foot. And it's got a shaped handle, perhaps with a rue head or something on the end. And then a very little spout. <clears throat> you notice the spout on this isn't terribly big. A uh, nice small one, but a, a very powerful body with a good, strong, wide, thick uh, neck. And tapers beautifully onto the base. All right, and these are the kind of things. This, this, this is great. This is interesting because it's, it's, a, it's a rhino horn cup uh, done during the Ming Dynasty, probably in the 15th century or the early 16th century. But the uh, work on it is based on, the decoration is obviously based on archaic bronzes. So you can sort of see why M M Mr. Brundage really might have liked this, because it's based on a bronze form. It's a small cup. It's superbly uh, well carved all the way around. The uh, graining and the texture of the uh, horn itself has been perfectly polished down. It's in absolutely splendid condition. And this is a very small cup. It's only uh, 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 four inches wide and a couple of inches tall, mm. but absolutely top quality. 
And then over here, you have this. It's a really nice piece of guanware. And it's a who form vase, obviously, um, with the uh, very thick glaze over the, uh, over the mask and ring handle on the side. But you can see how the glaze pulled back a little bit here. So you get some definition out of that ring. And, uh, but just notice how thick and even and perfect the glaze is. And this was a, a fairly small piece, about, uh, about uh, seven or eight inches tall. This is, these can look very big in photos, but these are fairly small um, often. So you want to sort of keep an eye out for that. All right, and then on to this. This is a Jai Jing, one of these very famous iron red and yellow uh, jars with dragons. Uh, the British Museum has one, the Met has one, and of course the, the, this museum has one. This is a particularly nice one because if you've seen a lot of these, you'll notice that the red on them, the red enamel was very prone to wearing off. So it's, you'll have these areas where that are sort of exposed up to the underneath. This one looks like it's been nicely cared for. And I love the facial expression on the dragon. He's sort of cartoonish looking, he's a goofy looking thing. And it, this is a small jar also, five inches tall, very small but beautifully done. And I want to just point this out. This is the other stuff that you're going to find on there if you're a dealer or you collect later Ming wares. Um, you want to check out their collection because they have things like this, this very nice Swato um, uh, plate with the double deer on it. And you've seen these before. These do turn up at auctions. They, they, they turn up here and there. Here's the back of it. We just added a, uh, a catalog over on the bit amount reference section on just these pieces, on Swato wares. And uh, here they have one, so you could you can come here and look up things that you you have, things that you found um, uh, maybe at auctions and whatnot, and that's a nice option to have. All right, they also have a lot of paintings. The painting I'm just showing one painting here because I just I love this thing with the geese on it. I just think they're great. It's a Ming painting. I don't think it has a signature, uh, but you know, as, 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 they, as somebody once said to me, the the best Ming painters are anonymous. And uh, uh, this is a, just a terrific painting of, of white-chested geese. And uh, it's a nice size, pretty good size, 50 inches. It's fairly large, but beautiful example. And then they have things like this, these Komatsuki-type pieces. Uh, there's been a couple of these that have turned up in auction in the last year uh, in the area. This one is inscribed. I love the mountain scenes. And fortunately, they show the back of it. Um, here it is with the applied feet and the unglazed uh, bottoms on it. And there's the accession number. But in this nice bluish glaze, very, very rare form, highly desirable. Uh, but the, the, the way they did the landscapes on these sort of oddly shaped um, mountain form dish um, um, is, is interesting. They, they claim this is in the form of Mount Fuji because these were meant for the Japanese market. And it's entirely, of course, it's entirely possible, if not probable. All right. And that's just a quick look at this museum. Uh, there is a, a lot of material on there. You could spend a day in there just going through the site. They're closed right now, of course, for the time being. Uh, uh, and, and I believe they're, they're in the middle of doing some renovation work there as well. But it's a spectacular museum with a spectacular collection. And uh, Avery Brundage made it happen. And it's a, it's a very interesting story, uh, uh, where he came from, what he did in his life, and how he did all of it. It just really is, truly is. And he was an extremely, extremely generous man. All right? Uh, you know, there was, there was no, he, he, had, he didn't gain anything doing this. He just wanted to be a good guy. And he left it all to the city of San Francisco as a present, because he, he lived there part of the time, and he loved it. He loved California. All right, that's it. We'll be back tomorrow with our regular video, our weekly video. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to us yet here on, uh, on, on YouTube, please do. Give us a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Um, come over to bitamount.com and use the site to find things, to look up things, to uh, uh, browse all the catalogs. There's over 500 catalogs on there now. We've added a few this week. We try to add some every week, uh, uh, papers and whatnot that people write, as long as they're well done and illustrated. All right. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe out there, and uh, we'll see you in our next time, our next video. All righty. Bye-bye.